pods and things like that. So, uh, so give that a try. All right, origin of aviation checklists. Where did this all begin? Let's find out by going to this web page, and now I have to uh, share this differently. Let me babysit my my Zoom. Pre that one there. Does that work? There we go. All right. I know it's tiny, so uh, I'll read part of it. In aviation, a pre-flight checklist is a set of tasks, as you know. Uh, so, for example, uh, following a checklist would have shown that the gust lock was engaged in a Gulf Stream 4 crash back in May 2014. And I'm going to show you more information about that later on. They, for, uh, this is a Gulf Stream jet uh, with two pilots, and they took off with the gust lock engaged. That's not good. Uh, so, uh, getting to the origin, according to um, the researcher Atul, I don't know how to say that name, uh, he wrote a very interesting book called The Checklist Manifesto. The Checklist Manifesto. He's a physician and he wrote it uh, basically with the medical system in mind and hospitals and emergency room checklists and things like that, but he, he mentions this and... Um, He's, uh, on Wikipedia, it says the concept of a pre-flight checklist was first introduced by management and engineers at Boeing following the 1935 crash of the prototype B-17, then known as the Model 299. Uh, so apparently this, guy, this was born back in the 30s, in other words, checklists. Um, and... Uh, so that means flying had been happening for some decades before that, before someone figured out, hey, we need to, we need to figure out a way to get people to stay on track and, um, and not forget things like guts locks or turn the fuel on or something like that. Uh, so uh, I'm going to let this, uh, I, I love it when I find uh, other speakers or, or, uh, or on video or live that uh, agree with me. <laughs> And that means uh, either we're both wrong or we're both right. So let me uh, get this shared over. And this is a five minute video that where this person says it better than I can. So let me get that worked out on Zoom. And launch and full screen. Welcome to our micro learning course about checklists in general aviation. The course consists of three short modules. This first module is an introduction. Uh, I'm going to stop for one second and be sure I have computer sound on. I do. Okay. All right. Let's go. ...to checklists, and it includes an interesting story about how aviation checklists came to be. Module 2 deals with the effective use of checklists and such things as which checklists are needed and what to do if you are interrupted while running a checklist. Module 3 concerns modifying or creating checklists to make them right for the individual and for the operation. It is not essential, but I recommend that you view the modules in sequence. So let's begin with a discussion of checklist basics. Today, checklists are used in many different industries for many different functions. The medical profession has embraced the use of checklists to help prevent errors, particularly in surgery and in surface transportation operations, and in many other industrial applications. Sometimes checklists are printed and sometimes they are electronic. We didn't always have checklists. Let's take a quick look at their origin. To do that, we will back up to 1935. Boeing introduced their brand new Model 299 bomber, which was to become the famous B-17. On October 30th, 1935 at Wright Airfield in Dayton, Ohio, the U.S. Army held a flight competition for airplane manufacturers vying to build its next generation long-range bomber. It wasn't supposed to be much of a competition. In early evaluations, the Boeing Corporation's Model 299 had outscored the designs of Martin and Douglas. Boeing's planes could carry five times as many bombs as the Army had requested. It could fly faster than previous bombers and almost twice as far. The flight competition was to be merely a formality. The Army planned to order at least 65 of the aircraft. 
A small crowd of Army brass and manufacturing executives watched as the Model 299 test plane taxied onto the runway. The plane roared down the tarmac, lifted off smoothly, and climbed sharply to 300 feet. Then it stalled, turned on one wing, and crashed in a firing explosion. Two of the five crew members died, including the pilot. An investigation revealed that nothing mechanical had gone wrong. The crash had been due to pilot error, the report said. Substantially more complex than previous aircraft, the new plane required the pilot to attend to the four engines, a retractable landing gear, new wing flaps, electric trim tabs that needed adjustment to maintain control at different airspeeds, and constant speed propellers whose pitch had to be regulated with hydraulic controls, among other features. While doing all this, the pilot had forgotten to release a new locking mechanism on the elevator and rudder controls. The Boeing model was deemed to be, as the newspaper put it, too much airplane for one man to fly. The Army Air Corps declared Douglas's smaller design the winner. Boeing nearly went bankrupt. Still, the Army purchased a few aircraft from Boeing as test planes, and a group of test pilots got together and considered what to do. They came up with a simple but previously untried approach. They created a pilot's checklist with step-by-step -step checks for takeoff, flight, landing, and taxiing. We know the rest of the story. The Boeing Model 299 became the B-17 and went on to great glory in World War II. And we know that the Boeing company has prospered and not gone bankrupt. The use of checklists rapidly spread throughout the military, and the practice was also incorporated by the airlines. But general aviation has been very slow in embracing the advantages of fully using checklists. We could argue for hours on what should be on any given checklist and exactly which checklists are needed. That's precisely the point of this series. The checklist has to be something that the pilot is comfortable with and has confidence in. We can start with any publication that the manufacturer provides and then expand from there. Obviously, we must be realistic about our checklist. The checklist is a tool to help us fly better and safer. It isn't an end in itself. Checklists must never get to the point where they interfere with flying the airplane. But that brings up a criticism of using checklists or perhaps an excuse not to use them at all. We will explore that and learn more about the effective use of checklists in the next module. We have completed module one, checklist basics. Continue this micro learning series with module two, effective use of checklists and module three, modifying or creating checklists. Links to all the modules plus more aviation safety videos can be found on genebenson.com. Interesting, huh? Um, yeah, so uh, taking off in a complex airplane like that uh, B-17, I, I can't imagine that they launched it ever without a checklist, but apparently those uh, checklists weren't a big deal back then. So uh, we have them to thank, uh, unfortunately, with their loss of life. Um, for the fact that we take checklists for granted now. So let's look at some other uh, articles and accidents. And uh, every time I do this, I gotta reshare. This gets a little bit tedious. I think that's the one I want. Yeah, so I know it's small and again, I'll let me expand it. Does that work? Okay. And. Uh, so as I said in the, in the promo for this webinar, uh, NTSB, through that 10 year period, approximately 279 aircraft accidents occurred in which a checklist was improperly used or not used. So the most common checklist error is failure to use a checklist, use of the wrong checklist, checklist flow interrupted, that's a big one, and checklist items overlooked, another big one. So for example, in a recent report to the Aviation Safety Re Aviation Safety Reporting System, ASRS, 
A Cessna 172 pilot shared this valuable lesson. When you're in a hurry and too rushed to use a checklist, that's the time to use a checklist. So uh, everything felt okay until just after touchdown, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so the airplane diverted in ways uh, that were almost uncontrollable and he almost uh, had an accident. So what he says was, instead of taking your breath and following normal procedure after the near crash landing, I was worried what others would think and I tried to depart the area as quickly as possible. Upon inspection of the plane, the trim was found to be in, in an extremely nose low position. Had I stopped and used my checklist, I would have taken off normally and not made a bad situation worse. Uh, so this brings to mind one of the reasons I, I shy away from touch and goes with student pilots, at least until they get really, really good with uh, just straight takeoffs and landings. Uh, so because at touch and go, there's, there's a lot going on. You're going from full flaps or nearly full flaps to flaps up, you've got a big trim change. Uh, you're going from idle thrust to full thrust, and you still got to do all this control of the aircraft stuff. Be ready with right rudder, uh, rotate at the right time, and do all that while you're rolling along and keeping the airplane on the center line, so you don't run off into the weeds. So, um, yeah. So uh, if you could, if you stop and taxi back, just take take your time. Then you got plenty of time to do the appropriate checklists. So how about fuel? Here's an article, tips to protect your plane from bad fuel. Very interesting article. I invite you to uh, look for in general aviation news. And uh, uh, so some of that is related to the, to the airport and the, and the, in other words, the fuel vendor and the, the big fuel tank. But uh, some of it is also related to what we can do as pilots, so what can you do to protect your aircraft? Um, so let's see, well, the, there are a number of suggestions. The one I wanna get to, um, if I stop share for a moment so I can just talk to you. Uh, so uh, years ago, I was flying with a FAA inspector. I think I was renewing my flight instructor certificate with him or something like that. Uh, and I was doing the pre-flight and I, I wasn't doing anything wrong. Uh, but he was kind enough to share with me how he pre-flights his 210. I think he had a Cessna 210, high wing airplane with bladder tanks. Uh, although the, the, because bladder tanks can trap fuel, the, the bladder isn't perfectly flat on the bottom. I'm sorry, it, it can trap fuel and it can trap water behind one of those bumps. Even without bladder tanks, regular metal fuel tanks, they can trap water because they have baffles to keep the fuel from sloshing too much. So water can get trapped in these things. He had a very interesting procedure, which I have yet to duplicate, but probably should. He said he'd walk up to the airplane, not touch it, other than to get the, uh, the little fuel strainer. And the type he used was the little cup with the flat bottom and the pin sticking out uh, so that he could grab a sample of fuel from the, the uh, wing drain, wing tank drain, set it on the ground. So that the flat bottom thing. Uh, of course, inspect it first. If nothing's there, he sets it on the ground, walks around the airplane without touching, without disturbing the airplane, does the same thing on the other side, inspects it, puts it on the ground, takes another one, goes to the gas collator under the engine, the low point, and tries not to disturb the airplane, gets some fuel, inspects it, puts it on the ground. And by then, several minutes have passed since he did the first one. He goes to that to see if anything has settled out any uh, particulate matter or if any water has condensed since coming out of the tank, because now it's at a different temperature. There's water in fuel all the time. It's just dissolved. When it's down to droplets of water, that's what's going to make the engine burp. Uh, so he'd look at it after letting it set for a while, and if no, no sediment or anything else has materialized, he will dispose of that properly. Uh, then grab the wing of the airplane and shake it like crazy to purposely disturb the fuel and dislodge any water that's hiding behind a bladder ripple or in another airplane, it would be the baffle. Gives a really good shake. Let's that settle down because now everything just shook up. So the water bubbles, if there are any, you're gonna have to settle down to the low point. 
So while that's happening, he goes around to the second wing that he had already done, looks at that, disposes of it, goes around to the gascolator one, let's see if anything sell out, gets rid of that. Goes back to the first wing, samples it again, puts it on the ground. Next week, samples it, puts it on the ground. Three. So he does all three places twice, once without disturbing the airplane, and once after purposely disturbing the airplane. And, uh, and he said he has caught water and sediment by doing that on the second try um, and, uh, and then had to deal with that. So, uh, wow, it sounds like overkill, but, uh, but if you're on the takeoff roll and the engine starts burping and scares you, uh, that can lead to trouble. So uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. All right, back to Mr. Checklist. And uh, so there's a ton of information out there about uh, checklist design and use. So to some extent, I'm gonna share resources with you and, and then we're also gonna, of course, uh, get more specific. So here's one particular uh, article, Co Cockpit Checklists, Concepts, Design and Use. And uh, so again, I'm just letting you know that this exists. Uh, we don't have time to read it all. But uh, although aircraft checklist has been around now a long time, since the 30s, uh, it has escaped the, the scrutiny of human factors profession. So, that, so human factors come into play about being in a hurry. You know, I've checked this, this fuel tank a million times. Nothing's ever happened. Never found any issues. So I don't need to be that careful. And that's called the normalization of deviance. It's always worked. So why should I worry? It's always going to work. And uh, of course, that's not true. You got to check it and be careful every single time. Um, let me go back to the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, so now we can, that, that Gulfstream crash that we talked about earlier, we can take a little bit deeper look at that if I can get this to cooperate. All right, new share, Gulfstream crash. All right. Gulfstream crash triggers a finding of unsettling data. And this is just an excerpt, uh, but this is the one that was mentioned earlier, an easily preventable takeoff accident that turned a Gulf stream into a deadly fireball has led to revelations of systemic safety lapses within business uh, aviation. And this was a situation where uh, I think also they, they failed to um, release the gust lock, if I remember correctly. Uh, so this graph, um, very interesting. So this is for 2013 to 2015. Flight controls check. So let me ask you this, how many opportunities do you have uh, when you're flying to be sure that the gust lock or gust locks are removed? Well, one is doing it verifying that you did it. And another one, isn't there a flight controls free and correct uh, for, for your aircraft when you're doing the before takeoff stuff? That's a secondary check that you have released the gust locks or removed the gust locks. Well, somehow there's plenty of folks that get past both of those checks and still attempt to fly with uh, their controls locked. So in this graph, uh, the gray vertical bars are number of flights. The blue vertical bars are the non-compliance events. And perhaps the, the most revealing part of this is the brown horizontal line that bounces around. And that's the non-compliance event rate. And the percentage is off on the right. And it hovers around 15 to 20% of non-compliance of some checklist item in this uh, survey that they did. I don't know about you, but I think that's huge. Uh, okay, so here's another uh, well-known uh, crash. Let me get back to that. So cockpit transcript uh, released and crash that killed inquirer owner. And uh, this is a news report, so it's a bit sensationalized, but still the, the information is critical for us. Uh, so this is uh, June 1st, 2014, showing NTSB and in in investigators at the scene of a plane that plunged down an embankment and erupted in flames. 
during an attempted attempt at Hanscom Field in Bedford, Massachusetts, where, where I used to fly, actually. And uh, let's see, let me get down to this paragraph. A preliminary report from NTSB suggested that pilot error, of course, it's always pilot error, but which error? Pilot error was likely a strong factor in the crash, as the experienced crew evidently did not perform a pre-flight check that may have alerted them to an issue with the gust lock system. Failed to do, uh, failed to follow a checklist procedure. Um, so not, uh, not a good thing. Uh, back to the, uh, so part of my point, I hope you're getting in, the, in this discussion is uh, these are highly experienced pilots, ATPs, two pilot cockpits, and they're still missing items. We need to be at least that careful because we're often one pilot or the instructor teaching the student. We got to make sure it gets done. We got to make sure the student develops their habits correctly. Uh, and students, when you go out there, <laughs> take this seriously. Uh, the, uh, uh, use the checklist as if your life depends on it. See what I mean? All right. Northwest Airlines, I remember this uh, from when I was a kid, flight 255. And let me show you this. All right, uh, so uh, it was a McDonnell Douglas MD-82, crashed shortly after takeoff from Detroit. This is back in 1987, killing a bunch of everyone but one, <laughs> along with two people on the ground. Um, the sec at the time, it was the second deadliest avi aviation accident Stop it, in the United States. Uh, so um, anybody remember this? Uh, anyone as old as me might. Uh, and uh, let me see if I can get there real quick. Hold on. Uh, they have the power communication. Plane lifted off. Oh, come on, where is it? OK, the cockpit voice recorder provided evidence of the flight crew's omission of the taxi checklist. Omission, an entire checklist they didn't even do any of. Although the stall warning was enunciated, investigators determined from the cockpit voice recorder that the oral takeoff warning was not enunciated by that warning system. The NTSB was unable to determine a cause for the electrical power failure in the uh, oral warning system. Uh, they couldn't determine if the circuit breaker had been checked. Uh, but part of the pre-takeoff checklist should have been to uh, check all circuit breakers. And um, final report in, uh, came out in 1988. The NTSB determines that the probable cause of the accident was a flight crew's failure to use the taxi checklist. And uh, the reason that the stall system was trying to alert them was this. So it's, it's part of it is that for some reason the stall noisemaker didn't work. Uh, but what precipitated this is that they didn't use the check, taxi checklist to ensure that the flaps and slats were extended for takeoff. These airplanes have to have all their lift devices out uh, prior to takeoff because that wing isn't designed to fly that slowly clean. Uh, so contributing to the accident was uh, the, the warning system didn't work. But I don't know that they could have uh, even done anything about it because once it's airborne and, and trying to stall, and the lift devices aren't out. I, I don't know that I don't think the airplane had enough power to just power through uh, the stall uh, warning and, and get back up to flying speed quickly enough. So I remember very well that the crew had uh, forgotten to put the lift devices out. And every time I flew as a passenger after that, I'd sit by the wing and I'd look outside and say, Are the flaps down? Are the slats down? <laughs> Not that I could prevent a takeoff if they were ready for takeoff, but. Uh, yeah, so they left out an entire checklist, and uh, and that's what happened. Uh, so 
you know, it doesn't only happen to uh, pilots, of course. Here's, uh, I, I certainly don't mean to put, to throw um, mechanics under the bus, but uh, we're all human and uh, we'll make mistakes. So here's uh, uh, the one of the NASA ASRS monthly newsletters, actually the current one, May 2020. And I encourage you to subscribe to this if you don't already. And it's the day in the life of a maintainer. And so uh, shortly after completion of a 100 hour inspection, um, this 172 pilot assumed the aircraft was airworthy. Engine trouble and subsequent discoveries proved otherwise. So uh, he took off, everything seemed fine. And, uh, but then he um, lost power at 9,500 feet, fortunately made a safe landing. Uh, but airplane had recently had a hundred hour inspection and uh, I'm bouncing around so I can find it. Uh, and it had 11 hours on it since the hundred hour inspection. The ignition harness had been replaced. That's fine. At the same time, a new electronic starter was installed. That's fine. It was apparent to the mechanic at the place that he had to make this forced landing that the spark plugs had been had not been removed, cleaned, or replaced. And that, that's definitely part of a 100-hour inspection. Remove, clean, inspect. Uh, one had ceased firing and was visibly oval-shaped from the wear. Another had corroded. All 12 had not been cleaned. There was visible rust, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the fact is that the, the Cessna 100 hour inspection checklist calls for not only a compression test, but also an inspection of all engine systems, uh, including finding anything that's uh, rusty and so on. So uh, uh, apparently that didn't get done during this 100 hour inspection. So again, not to throw uh, mechanics under the bus, they do great work, and yet they're, uh, they're as human as we are. Uh, yep, share screen, go back to that. And one more of these. So uh, cockpit checklists, concepts, design, and use. There's just a ton of information, lots of research that has been done over the years on, uh, on what makes a good checklist. And this uh, is from Human Factors Journal, cockpit checklists. And, uh, uh, and it says, although the aircraft checklist has long been regarded as a foundation of pilot standardization and cockpit safety, it has escaped the scrutiny of human factors profession. And uh, so now there's a lot of research on it. Let me take you down to the digestible part down here that we could talk about. So guidelines for checklist design and use. So based on this study, we propose a list of guidelines. All right, checklist responses should port portray the desired status or value of the item being considered, not just checked or set. So what does that mean? Let's just say there's, uh, you know, you wanna make sure the transponder is ready before takeoff. So it could say transponder hyphen check or transponder hyphen set. And they're recommending that it actually says something uh, 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 more meaningful like transponder uh, ALT, proper code, something like that. I'm making that up, but that when I see checklists like that, I. Uh, I, I appreciate the detail. Number two, the use of hands and fingers to touch or point to appropriate controls, switches, and displays while conducting the checklist is recommended. I remember way back in my primary, primary training, 1981, back at Tumac Airport near Hanscom Field in uh, north of Boston, uh, Bill Allen, my very excellent instructor, I was privileged to study with. Um, when we would be doing, let's say, the engine run up and uh, there's the oil temperature and oil pressure gauge, and the checklist says oil, te oil, uh, oil temperature green, oil pressure green, or something like that. 
And I lift my head and look at it and then look back down into the checklist. He said, no, look at the gauge and take your finger and touch it. And uh, I, I was not the type to question someone uh, that, that more advanced than me, so I didn't ask why. Uh, but I can tell you why. It's because when you're looking in that direction, you may be looking at the wrong thing. It seems weird, but there's a, there's a bunch of gauges lined up there. There's usually two fuel gauges uh, surrounding the oil temperature and oil pressure gauge. And if you just glance up and look at it, you're just looking at something. If you use your finger to physically touch it and your eyes follow your finger and you verify that the thing you're touching and looking at is the oil temperature or the oil pressure, now you have accomplished the checklist item, and now you know that your engine is, uh, is ready for takeoff. Uh, a long checklist should be subdivided into smaller task checklists or chunks that can be associated with symptoms, symptoms, <laughs> symptoms and functions within the cockpit. So when a checklist just gets too long, see if maybe there's a way to chunk it down. And this one I, I, I rarely see in a, in a manufacturer's checklist. And when I did my checklist, which I'll show you in a little bit for my T18, uh, I hadn't even read this. I just thought the logical thing to do is move your hand in, in a logical sequence. So it says sequencing of checklist items should follow the geographical organization of items in the cockpit and be performed in a logical flow. So if you're uh, uh, the circuit breakers, let's say in a, in a Cessna panel are typically off to, the, off to the right side, somewhere near the glove box. Uh, and the primer is way, way, way over there on the left side. So if you have one after another, you gotta look all the way to the right and then all the way to the left and then come back and see where the car beat is. So, um, uh, I think it makes more sense to kind of stay in the same region so you're, you're not bouncing around quite as much. So I'm not gonna go through this whole thing, but I want you to know it exists. And uh, if I remember when I send my follow-up email uh, after uh, I do the wings credit, I'll try to attach these PDFs for you. If I send, uh, if you get an email from me and I didn't, just please feel free to uh, reply and say, hey, where's my PDFs? And uh, I'll do that for you. Okay. All right, now let's look at some specific checklists. And so Cessna 150, I'm pretty sure everyone here has been in or near one. And it means, uh, how do I show it? I gotta show new share, bingo. All right, so expand that a little bit. So venerable 150, this is from a 1966 owner's manual, and uh, we got to drill down quite a ways. Oh, let's try page 30 and see what that does. Um, I got to find the right page for their checklist. Their Cessna checklists, oh, it's way back here, are, uh, are I find pretty sparse. Um, okay, so uh, even the, the walk around checklist, so this is actually pretty good. Or, I'm sorry, this is a taxi diagram. This is very well done because it tells you graphically what to do. Um, all right, where are the checklists? Oh, we're getting there. Building graph, did I pass it? Uh, all right, look what I found. All right, so let's, uh, let's kind of cr together critique this operating checklist. So before entering the airplane, make an exterior, make an exterior inspection in accordance with figure 1-1, great. And up above, uh, there's a pre-flight checklist and we can certainly critique that, but uh, we're limited on time, so let's just keep going. So seats and seat belts, adjust and lock. Uh, let me check the chat here if there's something I need to do. Cessna checklists are awful, yeah. <laughs> uh, seats and seatbelts. So I already have a problem with this. Can anyone uh, guess what it is? Just kind of 
think to yourself and uh, figure out what, what might happen. What I find very often with students is that as soon as, uh, as soon as there's more than one item on a line, they do the first one and not the second one. This happens very, very frequently. So even something like this, seats and seat belts, adjust and lock. Okay, so seat, they wiggle around the seat, right? you know, teach them how to make sure it's in the detent. And then they go on to number two, brakes. What happened to seat belts? So if uh, I actually encourage all my students to, uh, to, to create their own checklist for the airplanes they're gonna fly. And as long as it has at, at least what's on the manufacturer's checklist, if you break it out into smaller chunks or if you supplement it, uh, you know, you have to at least do what the manufacturer says. Uh, so brakes, test and set. Okay, that's not bad. Master switch on. Fuel valve handle on. Okay, that's not bad. What happens when you turn the master on in your typical older Cessna? Does anything make noise? Does anything uh, wake up? So maybe there should be subsection to this master switch on. You should hear sound because usually the uh, turn and bank or turn coordinator is electric. It should start to wind up. And uh, usually there's a flag that says there's no power. So that flag should disappear when you turn it on. The fuel gauges should come to life. No, we don't believe them, but they should wake up telling us there's power and things like that. So master switch on, but don't be mechanical. Like what's the consequence of turning the master switch on? Check for that. I hope you're getting the idea that the drilling down into, the, don't, don't just bounce through checklists because like an academic exercise. Pay attention to every single item and its consequences. Fuel valve handle on, that's good. All right, starting, let me get down here to something juicier before takeoff. Throttle setting, 1700 RPM, great. I would have loved for actually item one or item zero to be brakes set because uh, sometimes we get to the run-up area and they're just barely setting the, you know, tapping the brakes because we just taxied and you can, it doesn't take much brake pressure to stop taxiing, but it takes pretty good pressure to keep it from lunging forward when you ramp it up. So I, I wouldn't mind seeing an item that says brakes set. So throttle setting, engine instruments within green arc and generator light out. Well, which engine instruments? Every time we fly, I have to remind them, engine instruments, which ones are they? Uh, altimeter, no. <laughs> um, you know, heading indicator, no. Neither of those are the engine. Engine instruments. Uh, well, pressure, yes. <laughs> so why not say that? Oil pressure within green arc. Oil temperature within green arc, or at least off the peg, typically, if it's chilly out. Uh, generator light out or uh, ammeter check or voltmeter check, whatever's in the airplane. Uh, so <laughs> we can't go through this whole thing, but I, I really want to emphasize those kinds of details. Uh, and, and once again, I have to harp on the um, uh, putting two items in one line, flight instruments and radios. So actually there's a bunch of items in that one line because the flight instruments, how many are there? Three, attitude indicator, heading indicator, and altimeter, so tell me that. And radios, well, how many radios do I have? There may, there may just be one comm radio, there may be two comms, there may be a comm with a backup frequency, let's set both, do all this stuff. So even if you don't break it down to that detail, Here's what I find, flight instruments and radio set. Okay, flight instruments, uh, okay, attitude indicator. Uh, let's see, there's another one, What? something with a knob. Oh, the heading indicator has a knob. So I'll set that, what, how do I set it? Oh yeah, the compass. And uh, altimeter, how do I do that? Okay. Uh, and then they go to normal takeoff. Like radios disappeared. Why? Because it's in the same line. So when I have my students, make their own checklists. I like, please separate these, make flight instruments one line, make radios a separate line. And while you're at it, list the flight instruments. 
Okay, great, picky, picky, picky. As you know, I'm a uh, recovery engineer, so uh, so I can be obsessive compulsive, but if it's in the name of safety, I don't mind doing that. Uh, all right, come on, that's the 172. Uh, this is a later, well, it, it's not uh, different enough to worry about right now because we, we're limited on time here. So let me go back to this. Let's get to something more interesting. So the Mooney Master. So this is an older Mooney. They were made initially fixed gear, fixed pitch propeller. And I got to share that. So it means I go like this. And this is this is one of the most inadequate checklists I've ever seen. Uh, no incident, no, no disparagement meant towards uh, uh, Al Mooney. Um, but man, is it sparse. Uh, so uh, if I can find it. Uh, OK, what do we got? Pre-flight inspection. All right, let me expand that if I can. Come on, move over. All right. So the pro following pre-flight inspection is recommended. Check all switches off. Remove tie downs or wheel blocks, check tires and prop, clear of rocks, holes. Oh my God, all kinds of things on the same, uh, on the same line. So I'm not nuts about that. Um, all right, care of exterior, care of interior. Let me find, uh, oh gosh, what's going on? Uh, gosh, okay. Well, what I'm going to do is go to the next item over here, uh, which is my student's version of uh, that gave kind enough to give me permission to show this because they've been working on uh, creating their own checklist. And uh, let's just take a look at that and we can decide if we if we uh, agree with what they're doing or not. So uh, and they know themselves better than I do. So they, they say they like this level of detail. And I actually, for me, this would be overkill on the other side. It's not underkill, it's overkill. So uh, for example, um, all right, so before engine start. So adjust seats, belts, harnesses. Well, so this is sort of in contrast to what I just said. Now you've got uh, three things on one line. Seats, belts, and harnesses. Well, how about adjust seats, adjust seat belt, adjust shoulder harnesses. Uh, retract the step, flaps up. Note Hobbs tack time, you can separate them if you want. Circuit breakers, what about them? So here's where I would say circuit breakers check or circuit breakers all in or something like that. Uh, Check cow flaps open, and so there we're working on this. So this is a work in progress. So don't don't get too excited about it. But uh, so the best checklist I've found, and the research that I've done, tells you to name the item, and then say what to do with it, as opposed to check cow flaps open. How about cow flaps hyphen open. Now you know what you're gonna, what you're going to touch essentially, and what you're gonna do about it. Like this one, brakes, pedal test, seat track and back locked. So like that. So maybe do that with cow flaps. So that's always the same format, uh, and so on. So that, so interesting. This is majorly different than the manufacturer's checklist. Uh, and we haven't started flying yet because uh, of COVID and because of uh, the airplane really just got here from New Jersey. I just bought this beautiful little bird. So we've been working on it in ground school. So we'll see how if it holds up in the aircraft or if it, or if it ends up being more detail than they'd like. All right, super quick. Let me show you my, um, we're almost done. I got to skip around here a little bit. So. Uh, the T18 checklist that I inherited, in other words, the last guy uh, gave me this checklist with the airplane when I bought the airplane. So uh, it's pretty sparse. And uh, so pre-start, exterior, pre-flight, pre etc. 
start fuel on left mag on master on pump throttle twice do this do that um it there's not a lot uh and i i noticed that i kept having to think about what's missing and uh and uh I decided to make my own. So here's where I have mine now. And I gotta go share that. Let me share. And it's it's got just about as much detail as I want. What I did is I went through several iterations. So this this is one eight and a half by eleven page. So I just fold it in half. So I'm looking at either the page one or page two, and it's laminated. Uh, so I look at one side or the other. It's color coded. So the before engine start is all in one color, then engine start is in another color. Before takeoff is yet another color and split between pages. So I say continue down at the bottom of the first one uh, and so on. So it's grouped by color and by uh, objective, like before start, engine start and so on. And I'm, and I'm telling myself what to do at each item. Note also very important that they're numbered. Uh, all the reading I've done about checklist design says if you number the items, people are more likely to come back to the correct one when they, after they do something and then come back and do the next thing. Even if they're not counting the numbers, uh, there's just something about it, probably subliminal, that says, okay, I just did this one, now I got to do this one. And, and the numbers help. Uh, so uh, it seems to work that way. All right, just about done. We're gonna, I'm gonna have to skip what else I had. Uh, so the question was, is there a perfect checklist? Uh, the answer is no. Um, so, uh, so feel free to work on your own. Just make sure you always include at least what the manufacturer has. And then if you wanna reformat it and add some items and split things out, that's great. Make it work for you or, uh, or your student. So uh, I need to wrap it up. So I just want you to know uh, it's been a pleasure. And we, uh, um, fast team representatives, uh, do this because uh, we love to. We don't get paid. I'm not an FAA employee. I'm just a lowly flight instructor out here in Oregon. And, uh, and I love doing this. So I paid gobs of money for this Zoom license. I probably got four to six hours into this workshop design because it's the first time I've done this one. I've got this hour talking to you. I've got at least another hour follow up to get all the wings credit done and then email y'all. Uh, so with all that said, uh, this is not a, a, a call to action by any means. But uh, if you think I've deserved a cup of coffee, <laughs> buy me a coffee dot fill M and I'll include that in the email I sent you. Just a thought. And uh, please don't feel obligated. So here are the things uh, we talked about. and. Um, I hope it's been useful to you and thank you so much for attending and uh, I'm going to stop share and wave at you. Thank you so much. Um, my email again is over here. Oops, Gmail in the chat. So if you want to grab that, if you have anything to share with me or any questions, please do. And uh, go out and fly and fly safe and pay attention to your checklist. All right. Thanks. And have a uh, meaningful Memorial Day. It's not just a barbecue weekend. Remember what Memorial Day is about. All right. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.